back on the recording. Okay. And oh my goodness, Barb, how do you feel? I'm pretty good. Um, slow at everything. Slow at everything. But I'm a so, big girl. I got myself dressed. I got myself dressed today. <laughs> Did you have it done in Cleveland? No. Oh. Um, we're, uh, no, but the surgeon said we could come here. Um, and okay. Charlie, is, this is a, an ice machine that's circulating icy cold water oh, on wow. my shoulder. And Charlie is amazing because he got it to be able to hook, to, he got it to hook up into the car. So for the whole ride, I had ice wow. on my shoulder. Wow. Wow. Good invention. But this is hard and this is, I'm, it's everything slow. Yeah. My goodness. Well, thank you. But I'm happy to be here. We're happy you're here. And hug some ass, everybody. One, two, three. I suppose okay. we get started. I mean, and, you know, a couple, okay. and I'm just going to let people in as they enter in. Um, but uh, I think we have a, just about a minion here if I, you know, I haven't counted, but. Uh... Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to put a link in the chat because I made a kind of simplified. Well, um, I realized the. Um... And Deborah, will you do me a favor? Because as people come in, people don't see chats that were there they before sure. they came in. So if you can copy that link, please, and just yes, I shall. as people come in. Absolutely. Um, great. So before we get started, just as a little warm up, those of you who can type, um, put in the chat your favorite flavor of hamantashen, because I feel that's important information to have before um, learning Torah together. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad we're all traditionalists. That makes me happy. <laughs> See, it's a good lesson for um ah. Cherry. Wow. That's bold. That's what I like. I wasn't sure if you asked if I could make it. I, I don't have to. No, 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 no. <laughs> chocolate is good too. Dark chocolate. That's good too. Oh, well, that's fancy. That's probably good. So um, reminding us of the variety of opinions among the Jewish people as we uh, <laughs> return to our commentators. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Um, I just want to do a quick reminder of um, what we talked about last week, and then we're going to pick up looking at um, just a little part of even Ezra's. Did we get, well, we'll um, look at Rashi again and even Ezra there. Um, introductions to their commentaries and then um, launch into looking at some of what they do in action. Um, so if you remember last time we talked about um, that it's really kind of reading the Torah in order um, and exploring in a kind of systematic way details of the text within their context is a medieval project that Jews um, kind of adapt and adopt when they're living in um, Muslim intellectual environments where this kind of work is common, is was a common form of commentary on the Quran. Um, so once Jews decide that this is something worth doing, we then have to figure out how we're gonna do it. And um, the genre of shot commentary, right, became, as I say, a project that Jews decided they were gonna do, but, with a lot of kind of having to figure out exactly what that means. And 
Um, does pshat mean a surface meaning? Does pshat mean a contextual meaning? Does pshat mean kind of if you went into a room of 20 Jews and ask them what they thought it meant, what they would say. And that these kind of, some of the variations on what we ourselves think of as pshat go way, way back to the Middle Ages. And that one of the main questions in the Middle Ages um, when trying to figure out what this pshat project is, is what's its relationship to earlier, more kind of, traditional forms of rabbinic commentary on Torah that have been developed since late antiquity that we know primarily as Midrash or as Midrashic traditions that aren't so interested in the flow of a story or the meaning of a verse in its context, but are really focusing on particular details of the biblical text to kind of as anchors for some sort of augmentation of meaning. Um, and one of the other ways that Midrash is different from shot commentary is that in Midrashic commentary, you don't privilege the relationship of verses that come near each other to the whole canon. So if I wanna know what a word means in context, I that's in Brashit, that's in Genesis, I just as legitimately can look at how it's used in Proverbs as by trying to figure it out from context um, the way we would if we were reading in English. So these are some of the live conversations as the medieval commentators are really kind of constructing and experimenting with and creating different models of this project. Um, what I can't remember is, did we look at Rashi's introduction last time? I can't remember how far we got. We'll do it again. Um, do people still have the handout from last time by any chance? Oh, should, and I don't have it in front of me. So I'll go ahead and share this. I can share screen. Um, hold on, I just have to pull it up. So oh, before I um before we go to the text, um so there are um in any we talked about Mikrokit a load a little bit, so kind of the rabbinic Bible that has the um biblical text in the middle, has the Aramaic translation to the side, and then has commentators around the side, that they're always gonna have Rashi. Uh, so 11th century uh, to the very beginning of the 12th century, Northern France, Ibn Ezra starts out in Spain and then is in Christian Europe. A um, uh, little later than Rashi, kind of he's born at the very end of the 11th century and is working in the 12th century. David Kimchi from Provence, he's a uh, little later in the 12th century. And then Nachmanides um, starts out in Spain, ends up in Israel also. Um, uh, little later, 13th century. So those are the four commentators you're gonna find pretty much in any edition of um, Mikro Get Alot. And then there are other folks that depending on the version you're in also might show up. But of this crowd, Rashi and Ibn Ezra are kind of the, they make for nice kind of iconic examples of different approaches because even though there's some overlap between them, the parts of them that don't overlap are very distinct. And um, they, they serve as good models for thinking about um, what are the sorts of questions commentators were asking? What are the sources of authority and what are the methods they're using to answer? Um, and I think as you all know, Rashi wins, right? Rashi becomes the most authoritative Jewish commentator on Bible to the point where if you roll in traditional settings, there is a, um, 
almost a conflation between the biblical text itself and Rashi's commentary on it. That Rashi's commentary is really quite, becomes normative and hegemonic in understandings of the biblical text. Um, so with that, I am going to share my screen and Deborah, you need to make me the co-host. Do not do it, go down to participants. So Deborah, you go to participants and then next to my name, you'll get the three little dots and you can get to make co-host. Or it may be a drop down. There you go. Ah, beautiful, okay. Thank you, okay. Um, so this is just a little excerpt from um, Rashi's introduction to his Torah commentary. Um, will somebody go ahead and just read that first part starting there, many Midrashim? I, I can offer to do that. Great, thank you. There are many Midrashim, but our sages have already set them in place in Genesis Rabbah and in other Midrash collections. My own purpose is to explain the straightforward sense of the text, using only those details from traditional lore that most fit in to resolve difficulties in the flow of the story. The words of Torah are like a hammer that shatters rock, with a single phrase splitting into many different meanings. My own purpose is to simplify, to settle what each verse means in context. Good. Um, so let me make it so I can see you all. Um, I think people are just going to need to holler like a fishwife or not as you, uh, as you wish. Oh, no, now I can see you all. Um, so what's Rashi saying here? What's his... What's he saying about Torah? What's he saying about Midrash? And what's he saying about his commentary project? So one thing he's saying is that he's gonna be really conservative, I think, in, in, in how much he, well, I mean, he wants to put it in text, but he's not going to take, um, you know, major flights of fancy, right? It, it's 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 just going to try to clarify, it, you know, the context that's needed to better understand a specific phrase. But he's not going to do anything that you know, snacks midrash, or you know, is like trying to it, that is going to be particularly imaginative. I guess is what it says to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think the other, another thing he's saying is that, or claiming, turns out I think to be untrue, <laughs> claiming not to have any homiletic um, uh, investment here. That he's, you know, just the just the facts, you know, <laughs> just the facts, ma'am. No, no homiletic interpretation, but it really isn't true. I mean, he <laughs> and he does cite midrash all the time. So I don't know why he says that, but okay. <laughs> also, he, also, he wants also he he, uh, he wants to settle things. He wants to be the definer. Ah, good. Okay. Does he say he's not going to cite midrash? Well, <laughs> no, but I thought that's what the implication is. So how is he saying he's going to? What's going to? Um, what's going to determine his selection process is whether he cites midrash or not. Well, I think he's saying only what clarifies the narrative as opposed to what clarifies the mean, the, the moral or otherwise meaning. 
great. So he says that he's, he says there are all those midrashim out there. I'm not going to bring them all. I'm going to bring the ones that resolve difficulties in the flow of the story. So Mim, I love that you were focusing there on like what we need to understand the narrative. Um, what's he saying? Uh, yeah, Ralph. Uh, actually, I think De Debbie had her hand up before me. So. Oh, Debbie. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say what strikes me is what he doesn't say which is that he's going to look at the linguistic issues that may be confusing. Like he's talking about the phrase and context, which means it out of historical context or, you know, something about the situation that's present, but he doesn't talk about different, there are parts of textual analysis he doesn't talk about at all. Good. That's all I was thinking. Great. Ralph, then Bob. I was going to add that some sages seem to go out of their way to um, come up with a different opinion and then start grabbing midrashes just to justify it. So they they actually are di uh, divergent. And I think Rashi's saying, I'm going to try to be convergent. Okay. Nice. Bob. Uh, one way I try to understand things is to think about sentences as incomplete. So when I read the, my own purpose is to simply, is simply to settle what each verse means in context, I would add in context from my point of view. Good, great. And um, take a look at the second paragraph where it said the words of Torah, like a hammer that shatters rock with a single phrase splitting into different meanings. My own purpose is simply to settle what each verse means in context. So what's he, why do you think he puts that first sentence there? What does he mean by it? And what's its function in this context, which is an intro to a shot commentary? Luther. Well, it's a little, it almost strikes me as contradictory, but I'm not reading it in the original language that he wrote it, but if the words are the hammer that shatters the rock, he then says that the words also are the rock. They're wow. both the hammer and the rock because a single phrase can be split into many different meanings. So if a single phrase can be, so um, Luther, I'm glad you said contradiction there because he's actually giving you two kind of hermeneutics, two ways of reading Torah here. Steve. I was, uh, I thought it was, and I don't can attribute it to Rashi's personality, but I thought it was a, a, a way of not being critical of those who might interpret in different ways. He's saying the words of Torah are such that they can be uh, taken in lots of different ways. And that's their nature. And he's trying to help rather than saying this, these people are wrong. Only my way is the, the right way. Right. Good. So he's saying there's this really legitimate way of reading Torah that understands it as multivocal that actually reads against context, right? And um, that was the way, that was the traditional authoritative way of reading Torah since the rabbinic period, right? That's the, in Rashi's time, that's normative. That's Midrash. And how is he juxtaposing, how is his brand new medieval approach, right? Which was then a brand new modern approach, right? How is he juxtaposing that in the sentence that says, my own purpose is simply to settle what he diverse means in context? Michael, I see your hand up. Yeah, it seems uh, to me, the second paragraph, as you said, he's using Torah, Midrash, something to justify what he's about to do. He's gone in a circle. He needs a justification for what he's going to do, and he uses what he says he's going to do to justify what he's going to do. Okay, so you can understand it as there are all these different meanings. I am going to select one. Good. How else? How else might you understand the the relationship of those two sentences? 
Michael, is that a new hand or an old hand? Old hand. Barb. Can you repeat that question again? I'll say I'm sorry. What? Hey, Barb, go ahead. Could you repeat that question um, oh. again? Oh. Yeah, so um the so if the traditional way to read has been this hammer shattering a rock, interpreting every word six ways to a dozen, what's he telling us about if those are our expectations of Jewish Torah commentary, which they would have been in the 11th century, because that's all anybody had been doing for centuries. What's he setting us up to expect in his commentary instead? Well, maybe Rashi was a very early geologist and very much ahead of his time because a rock, each different kind of rock, and you can read that as each different kind of word, when you shatter a specific rock, it shatters a specific way, it cleaves a different way. Now, it will break into different pieces depending on how hard you hit that rock. So perhaps it's how hard you study that word that you find many more meanings and, and, and it just gets more granular. Nice. nice. Um, so th this, um, and that the statement, the words of Torah like hammer that chatters rock is an old rabbinic statement. So absolutely that like how you hit it is gonna determine what the different pieces are. Who was it who said, Ralph, was it you who talked about, no, who talked about divergent and convergent earlier? You moved around on my screen. Yeah, that, that, that was me, that was me. Great, okay. So I think what Rashi is doing here is saying, all you Torah readers have been trained culturally to expect divergent. I'm gonna do a new project. I'm going to do contextual and convergent, and that's going to feel new and weird to you. It doesn't mean I'm rejecting our traditional atomized hammer and rocky way of reading Torah. Those are still good. They're still terrific, but you shouldn't expect that of me. So on the one hand, he's saying, I am doing something very new that's going to be really different from what the rabbis of late antiquity did. But he's saying, and um, those of you who were talking about the first sentences, um, he's saying, but I'm not going to abandon that material. I'm going to cull selectively from that earlier way of reading Torah as the resources I'm going to use to do this new contextual convergent narrative kind of reading. So that's kind of how Rashi sets himself up. Um, and those of you like Mim and those of others of you, Debbie, who are familiar with Rashi, the kind of conservativeness that this might lead us to expect from where we sit, doesn't feel so, feel Rashik for a guy who says he's doing something different from Midrash. But if you think about it as this was kind of one of the earliest forays into non-Midrashic reading, right? Then um, I think it resituates him a little differently. So we're now gonna bump ahead 75 years or so. Is it that many? Uh, no, about 50 years, 40 years, um, to Ibn Ezra's commentary. And we're not going to read the whole thing, but let me share it. Um, oh, wait, you're still seeing it, right? I just, hold on. So you can even see, so Ibn Ezra is going to list five paths 
of how you can do shot commentary. The first four, he is going to be very, very critical of. And then he's going to get to the fifth, which is his recommended way. So even before we um, look at what he says, the fact that he can describe four ways of doing shot commentary and tell you how terrible four of them are, what does that suggest about where we are in the development of this genre compared to where Rashi was? He must be further along. It must be further along. If there are already four methodologies that I can trash, right? If there must have been more people experimenting with the genre from different perspectives. So now let's look and see what Ibn Ezra says he's going to do. Um, and he criticizes people who are too midrashic. He criticizes in the second path the Karaites who ignore rabbinic tradition entirely. Um, the third path are people who only read allegorically, right? Um, he disregards that one too. Um, oh, he does too kind of allegorical. The fourth one is the people who are too midrashic. And then the fifth part, the fifth one is what he says he's doing. So will somebody go ahead and read um, how Ibn Ezra describes his method? And I can't see you again, so just somebody start reading. The fifth path, the one on which I shall set forth my own commentary, is the one I think is right in the eyes of God. I treat God alone with awe and will show no favor to the Torah, seeking the correct meaning of each and every word with all my might. Then I will interpret each verse as best I am able. You will find the meaning of each word explained at its first occurrence. I will pay no attention to spelling. The traditional explanations of spelling differences are all midrashic. Am I supposed to believe that Moses wrote some words with a vav and um, Hezekiah's scribe wrote the same word in a different verse without a vav, both meaningfully both meaning, meaningfully despite the intervening centuries. Such stories are good for children. Onkelos translated the Torah correctly into Aramaic. And if he sometimes resorts to the use of Mitrash, we know that he understood the basics perfectly well. He was trying to make sure that the most oafish people would still understand the Torah correctly. Okay, let's pause there and and, and uh, see what he's saying here. So what's he telling you about what he's going to do and what he's not going to do? He's got excellent snark, too. One through four yeah. even snark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, between, I mean, of course, this is a translation, but I'd love to know what the words were used for oafish. Um, and I, I'd love to know how he has a direct signal to what God wants and what God sees. Um, but, you know, so the guy obviously had quite the ego. It's uh, maybe, you know, some of it may be based on, you know, reality. He's a very, very intelligent scholar. So, but, uh, you know, I, what's interesting to me is he doesn't actually explain it, what what he's using, what capabilities he's using to figure out, or what value system he's even using to figure out what God wants. Good. Aside he's from his own instinct. I, 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 I can't read this and understand. I mean, they get the point about the spelling differences and okay, I, I, you know, I, I see where that is, but it's so much more than that, right? It's, it's, but, and he's going to get there. He's okay. going to where this is just the beginning. So okay. yeah. Carol and me. Well, his references to Onkelos, when was Onkelos committed right. to paper? Or, right. or, so, so because Onkelos obviously is, he thinks he thinks it's obviously thinks that it's close 
because it's closer in time to uh, whenever the Torah was put together, uh, which is interesting, is closer in time to the Torah, so to speak, that you're better off, you can have a more authoritative clue to the meanings by using the Aramaic instead of using the Hebrew. Which is, I, I do, I, do people still do that? I have a feeling they might. They certainly right. use, like, you know, the, the, the Septuagint for the same right. purpose. Why not? So I don't think he's saying instead of the Hebrew. So everybody, Onkelos was the authorized Jewish Aramaic translation of the Torah. That's what you get in Mikrot Gidolot. It's been around since before the turn of the millennium, of the first millennium. So it's really? old. And... Um, Often when there, and as Mim saying this still happens, if there's a word whose meaning is obscure in Hebrew, one of the ways that um, scholars will try to figure out what it means is by looking at the ancient translations. Because if it's translated into an Aramaic word we understand or into a Greek word we understand, that can sometimes help back translate into the Hebrew. So he's absolutely, he's saying, Onkelos is going to be one of my sources when something's tricky. But You know, I, I read this um, as a kind of anti-intellectualization uh, that people can be so clever about the details that, you know, they can do a kind of sophistry where they take something that clearly means yes and they turn it into a phrase that means no. And he's saying, you know, don't be so clever that you think you can, you know, twist the uh, the words to mean what they don't clearly mean. Good. And who, what readers, what Jewish readers derived meaning from spelling differences? The mystics. The mystics. Good. Who else? those late antique rabbis of the Midrash. One of the things that Midrash uses, so the, one of the differences between a shot reading strategy and a Midrashic strategy is that a Midrashic strategy says things like spelling are semantically significant. And that the way that if there are alternative spellings, those alternative spellings have a difference in meaning. It's as though um, we thought that when color is spelled C-O-L-O-R, it means one thing. But when it's spelled C-O-L-O-U-R, it's meaning something else. That's how Midrash reads spelling difference. And even Ezra says, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Um, also the mystics, right? The mystics read in that hyper significant way that tiny details that we don't, when we're reading normally, don't think are semantically significant. They thought encoded a lot of knowledge. Um, so he's not going to do that. He's not going to, um, wait, hold on, I've lost my place. Um, and he's going to use Onkelis and why might, what criticism is he uh, expecting when somebody said, when he says, um, Uncle has translated the Torah correctly in Aramaic, and if, if he sometimes resorts to the use of Midrash, we knew that he understood the basics perfectly well. What accusation is he expecting that he's trying to ward off? Hmm. Yes, yeah, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not answering that. I had a question. I'll, I'll oh. defer if you like. Would you, would, do you want me to go ahead? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, my question was, uh, and this is probably right out of left field. So I'm my, uh, sorry for that, but it comes to mind. Did, did, you know, we, we think of ourselves as moderns and certainly in the, within the reconstructionist tradition we're talking about well you know the writers of the Torah as opposed to the words of Moses or the words of the Lord etc yeah. etc et um and and maybe with a little humility we ought to say that you know these ancients these uh medieval commentators there's some pretty smart cookies amongst them 
Uh, did Rashi or any of these uh, commentators that were citing up until this time question that this was Moses' words uh, as opposed to rewritten by interpreters later on? Not yet. I thought you were going to say something different. I thought you were going to say, did they think they were modern and new? And the answer is absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's a good answer as well, or good answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they did not yet. Like Spinoza is kind of the first Jew to say different authors in the Torah. Um, so I think here, he's, he came out in the earlier parts pretty strongly saying, Midrash is something different from Torah. He, um, I'm finding it, hold on. Do, do, do. Um, Elsie, he trashes the Midrashim in the fourth path. path. Then why does he have to? So here he's saying, um, Uncle Liss is an authority for me. And you can imagine somebody saying, You just trashed Midrash as an authority. Sometimes Uncle Liss uses Midrash. And he's already kind of slicing that pie and saying, Uncle Liss only uses Midrash when he needs to help un people ex understand the plain sense of the text. Who else says they use Midrash that way? Rashi. Exactly, right? So even Ezra is going is setting himself very much in opposition to Rashi, but actually they both understand there to be a role for Midrash in explaining the plain sense. But as um, Mim, I think even Ezra read Rashi the way you do that like, he was a hell of a lot less conservative about his use than he'd make you think up front. Um, so let's look at, um, will somebody please read the next paragraph? Am I still sharing? Am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. Why aren't I seeing it? Yeah. Wait a minute. Are you all seeing the share? Yeah. Yeah. To be sure. I need to raise it up, though. I think, at least on my screen, you need to that raise it up. Are you, you're asking about, is it to be sure? Is that the paragraph question? Um, yes. Okay. I'll just go ahead and read it. Great. Thank you. To be sure when it comes to the laws, if we find two possible meanings, we will follow the one handed down by our righteous sages we can rely perfectly on them. God forbid that we get mixed up with the Sadducees who say that our tradition falsifies the text or in such cases, the grammarians either. Our sages were true, all their words are true. May the true God guide his servant on the true path. But so what's Ibn Ezra's question here? What's the question he's imagining he's being asked and what's his answer? How do you know who's right? Good. In what cases? Um, in the cases of, um, I guess, it, it looks to me like he's saying, oh, our righteous sages, they had it right. So don't okay, but, anymore. But who well, he's, it, what's weird to me is that it sounds like he's, like the sages are infallible. I mean that that these these are the these are everything is the right word. There are no contradictions. I mean that isn't even plausible. I mean I, I guess to my mind or to my modern mind, okay, that you would never have mistakes when you are you don't have printing and you are you are writing everything by hand. I mean you know, so I. So I am, I am guess I am confused at what he really means. Um, I, okay, I see Nim just raised her hand. 
Yeah, I think there's a distinction here between the halachic and the non-halachic. That uh, when it comes to interpreting words, if there's any dispute, the Talmud's got the answer and the sages are, are perfect. And he doesn't want anyone to think he's unorthodox. He's, he might be unorthodox in his method of reading text, but not when it comes to laws. Good. So when it comes to the law, so when we're reading narrative, if there are a bunch of different possible meanings, which of course we all know there are because, right, they knew it because the rabbis had determined it, the late antique rabbis. We know it because we're postmodern. And in those cases, even Ezra is going to do contextual meaning. However, as Mim's saying, when it comes to law, if there are multiple possibilities, the sages are the authoritative articulators of the law. Ralph. Yeah, I was going to add, it seems like in a, in, a, in a lot of Torah commentary, even when there's a clear meaning, they still find a second meaning in it. And if there's mistakes, they actually look at the mistake was there for a reason, and they actually riff on that. Good, good. Um, wait, who else? It's telling me two participants raise hands, but I'm only seeing one. Does someone else? Oh, Michael, there you are. Yeah, it's a little bit of an aside, but I can't help it because we're from Washington. Uh, he's making, I think he's making a political statement also between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And therefore, do I assume that he's taking the Pharisees side of the fight? Yeah. Or is this just in passing? But it's a very strong statement, God forbid. That's a political statement. Good, good. And yeah, this is all, we've moved inside the beltway in this paragraph in all sorts of ways, right? He's talking about legal authority um, and he's being partisan. Um, so when he talks about Pharisees and Sadducees here, they are proxies for Karaites and Rabbinites. Um, so the Karaites were a um, group of Jews living in all the places that Ibn Ezra was living that did not accept rabbinic authority. So they were, they were the Protestants the Rabbinites are the Catholics, the, Sadge the um, Karaites are the Protestants. The Rabbinites believe that there is a whole authoritative tradition outside of scripture, right? That's the oral law, that's the words of the sages, that is authoritative in determining practice and doctrine. The Karaites, like the Sadducees, say no, it's us interpreters and the scriptural text itself. So when he's saying Sadducees here, he means Karaites. Because the Karaites were saying, all you Rabbinites, you know, you're crazy people. You have granted scriptural authority to all these human people. Um, and that has led you to kind of create this whole shadow Torah where the Karaites are saying, We've got the Torah, um, period. So he's gone after the Karaites here. Um, so knowing that this is a live cultural debate among Jews, it's really important for him to say, Mim is exactly as you were saying, when it comes to halacha, when it comes to law, I'm a rabbinite. And Deborah, I think one of the things that might lead you astray a little bit here is when you see the sages, right? That is the collective authority of the rabbinic past. It's not that, you know, Rabbi Ishmael was never wrong and Rabbi Eliezer was never wrong, but that collected the collective opinion of the sages. So if you're, you know, reading the Talmud and it says, you know, Chachamim say, or, you know, um, halacha according to X, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the authorized legal opinion. Gotcha. And so um, I have just a very brief and maybe off the wall question, but I thought that care rights still existed to some degree and really small. They, yeah, they do. But they don't, don't, they aren't completely gone, right? Is Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, but now where they are larger 
more prevalent yeah. entity oh, yeah. at the time that no they gave the rabbinites a run for their money especially in places like egypt in north africa in the in the islamic world um there's an amazing scholar at princeton named marina rustow who's done a ton of kind of uh, historical anthropological work on relationships between Karaites and Rabbinites. And it turns out, it's so bizarre that we were surprised by this. Um, even as they were ideologically distinct, they were sociologically interconnected. Like Rabbinites and Karaites did business with each other. They intermed, they, there were, you know, mixed marriages. Um, we would not be so horrified if somebody told us, can you believe it? A reformed Jew married a conservative Jew, right? This would not be so shocking to us despite ideological difference. But um, for a long time, they were understood to be communities that were kind of in Romeo and in, in Montague and Capulet kind of antagonism. And that seems not to be the case, but pretty ideologically distinct. Um, okay, so I want to take the last 10 minutes. So you have a sense of what Rashi says he's doing, what Ibn Ezra says he's doing. Um, and I want to, where should I? And so we're gonna start actually just with a little bit from this week's Parsha. And then next week, we're gonna bounce back to Brayshit. The ones in Brayshit are, oh no, you know what? We'll look actually, we'll look at one little piece from Brayshit. So um, did everyone see the link I put in the chat? Does everyone have access to that? Okay. So open that up. Oh, I'll share. How about if I do that? I'm going to copy it over in the in case people came after. I know there are a couple of people. Thank you. Okay, this will work. So I'm going to scroll down. So this is one verse out of this week's Torah portion. Um, uh, Vayomer, ein kol anot gvura, ve'en kol anot chalusha, kol anot anochi, kol anot anochi shomea. So this is what's happening after Moses has come down the mountain. He hears the sounds of the people um, uh, celebrating around the calves they have constructed. And this is what he says. So um, Rashi's first comment is, so the quote is, it is not the voice of the cry of mastery or gura strength. And he says, this sound does not seem to be the sound of the utterance of victors who cry victory, nor is it the sound of the defeated who cry, alas, let me flee. So that's his comment on this verse that's in the English, it is not the sound of triumph or the sound of defeat. Um, so what's he, what's he doing in this comment? Why does he think, do you think that this verse needs comment and what's he clarifying for us? Maybe he's saying it's not a human voice, but it's God's voice. Ah, uh, he could be saying not human voice, God's voice. What else? Remember, he's hearing it from, like Moses is hearing it from the people down below. Yeah, it could be he's trying to think, he, he, he's trying to interpret what he's hearing uh, but I don't know how much interpretation it needs. <laughs> so what? what's the problem, I guess, 
isn't it always with Rashi you say what what what's the question? We know the answer now. What's the question? Good. What so is what, clear? <laughs> good. What does he think is not clear about this verse? And it's always a little hard to do in English because English is already pre uh, translation is pre interpreting a little. Mm -hmm. But the first word is gvura, which we usually think of as strength, right? And then the second word is halusha, which most normally means a kind of physical weakness. Good. So <laughs> thank you for the um, demonstrations. Um, so what's he, if a really literal translation were, it's not the sound of strength and it's not the sound of weakness, then what's he, what's he explaining for us? What's his question and what's he explaining? Carol, I see your lips moving, but you're mute. There you he go. wants to know what's going on down there. So he wants to know what's going on. And, he, and specifically, what does he want to know? Is it good or bad? What? Is, <laughs> should, he be, is, should he be glad to hear hearing it or should he be sorry to be hearing it? Well, is I, it I guess I, I look at it and I said, is it a battle? It doesn't look like it's a battle. Right? Because so, we don't have people who are either, you know, excited about their victory or defeated by their loss. So what are they? This is not maybe the normal, you see mobs of people gathering and it's not people fighting each other or, so what is it? Right. He's, uh, he's eliminated the, uh, uh, the extremes and now he's confused about what's going on in the middle. Could, could he be saying it's not, it's not self-serving? Uh, where do you see that? I mean, the victor is trying to, you know, claim their role in history. The defeated might be trying to make excuses for what went wrong. And so, so this would be more of a, if it's not from either extreme, it's more of a uh, kind of a solid basis. Okay, so it's kind of, a, in, again, in the middle. Uh, Luther. It, it's, it reads to me more like he's he's clarifying that we're not talking about a martial battle. We're not even talking about a moral conflict. That's not what Moses is hearing. He's hearing a celebration, but you know, he's he's he's, he's really clarifying that. Nobody's, there's no conflict here. Go ahead, Carol. And the fact that he says nobody is fleeing, they're not scared of anything. So they're staying, they want to be there. They're excited and happy perhaps. So he's envisioning Moses coming down the mountain. He's you know, however that mountain is constructed, he can't see into the camp. He can only hear. And he hears, <laughs> his first thought, right? They just escaped Egypt is, is there a battle happening, right? Not like if you imagine, if you think of Rashi kind of imagining himself into Moses's experience, if I were Moses on that mountain, my first thought might be, you know, is there a battle? Have the Egyptians come after us? Is there some sort of infighting? So the first thing, Mo so he's imagined Moses kind of doing that parsing that you all just talked about, like, wait, I'm hearing all these noises, but it's confusing. It doesn't seem to be the sounds of battle. It's the sounds of, um, and then we're going to get to this part. Um, um, Kol anot anochi shomea. So this word anot in the first two parts have been um, what's getting translated as sound, but then it's the nature of the sound in the last part. So it would be, um, it's not the sound of strength I hear, it's not the sound of weakness, rather it's the sound of sound that I hear. Um, so, uh, and we'll get to that part. Let's look at what um, Ibn Ezra tells us about that very same clause. Uh, 
So his comment on, oh, first he's going to say, he's going to clarify that it's Moses, not Joshua. Um, and then he's going to say, the word halusha is a noun. It's just like the word glura, which is also a noun. Um, so what's Ibn Ezra's question and what's his answer? His question is as specific as his answer. Well, he's saying that this is not, he's, he, 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 it seems to me he's saying this is not um, an action at all. It's a noun. It's like the opposite of Buckminster Fuller. Good. So, halusha can also, for those of you who have some Hebrew, can also be an adjective, right? The same form can can serve as an adjective, usually would sort serve as an adjective. Most of the time that you saw halush or halusha, it would be an adjective and um, describing this a note. And, what, and instead he's telling you, no, it's a noun, just like vura is a noun. So he's asking this a very specific grammatical question. What part of speech is this? And then he tells you. And the difference in this context, if you were to understand it as an adjective, it wouldn't have a very big effect on your semantic understanding. So this is a place where, so based on these two comments, if this was all we had of these two guys shot commentary in our last minute, what would you think shot meant to Rashi? And what would you think shot meant to Ibn Ezra? So I was thinking about it from the point of view of what does Rashi mean by context? And so, you know, I think he's, for lack of a better way, of I, I would think it just, it's sort of descriptive. He's giving you an idea of what it felt like to be there, what, you know, the conditions were. Um, that's clearly not what even Ezra is going after. <laughs> even Ezra is, you know, okay, what's the word mean? All right, yeah. let's make sure that we're dealing with the right terms, and then we can interpret. But we don't have to interpret here because is, is, he, is, he, is he also trying is he also trying to say that it's grounded in things and we shouldn't get emotional about it that there's this there's like 10 pegs this fundamental understanding that we can go from oh you mean that he's saying noun not adjective yeah hold that thought and see as we read more even as we're next month whether that whether um that holds true luther well, it sounds like Rashi is really trying to sort out the story arc. And even Ezra isn't interested in that at all. He's just interested in the meaning of the words. Good. So from what we have, if this is all we had, even Ezra kind of assumes that except for the technical amb ambiguity of grammar, we don't need more to understand this verse. Right, what we get from reading it gives us pshaw. It's not ambiguous. It's not particularly polyvalent. And as you all are saying, for Rashi, pshat is um, really being able to imagine ourselves into the story. Often I'll say to my students, if you were to make the movie, what would the characters be doing? And that's kind of what Rashi thinks Pshat is. Like, can we, um, that Pshat is being able to kind of fully imagine this story unrolling before our eyes the way it would if it were a movie. 
And from this example, Ibn Ezra says, no, like you'll read it, you'll get it. I'm going to explain to you um, some grammatical, um, some grammatical ambiguity here. And we're going to look at other Ibn Ezra. He's going to get more expansive than that. But even this one, just to give you a taste of these are two masters of shop um, who clearly understand the shop project in really different ways. Um, and with that, Chag Purim Sameach, I will see you all. So April, because the first Monday, oh no, we are doing the first Monday, right? Yes, okay, I have to remember because I will be out of town. Um, but I think I can still do it. Let me double check, Deborah. I may get back to you. I may need to do a switch. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> that's the one right before you have to. Bye, y'all. Right. Bye. See you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Bye. 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 Bye.